Chapter 2, The Audience, Its Role, and Imagination. This chapter begins on page 27. How is viewing a movie different than watching a play? And most of you have probably seen a movie, either at home or in the movie theater. Um, um, some of you may not have seen a play before, and that's perfectly fine. That's what this course is meant to do, to introduce you to theater if you don't have any previous experience. Um, but the two experiences are very different. So how is viewing a movie different than watching a play? Well, for example, films direct your attention by cutting and slicing images together. And because of that, they can manipulate what you see, what you focus on. Um, uh, whereas in theater, which is live, and that's a key um, aspect, that's what makes it different than a lot of other art forms or entertainment uh, mediums is that uh, that liveness means that you can look wherever you want whenever you want put emphasis on certain visuals ignore other things um, because you're not being as manipulated by editing now in theater we have um, what's called the performer audience relationship and in fact any sort of live performance uh, has the performer audience relationship and this performer audience relationship is being in the presence of the performer rather than in the presence of the image. And because of that, the performer and the audience can act and uh, on each other and react to each other. So you can um, conceivably uh, change a performance based on your reactions to the performance and based on the performer's reception of your reactions. So there's this great um, quote, and this is on page 28 of your textbook. Um, and it's sort of set off uh, uh, on either side into its own small little um, uh, set off box. And it says, theater is not electronic. Unlike movies and unlike television, it does require the live presence of both audience and actors in a single space. This is the theater's uniquely important advantage and function. Its original religious function of bringing people together in a community ceremony where the actors are in some sense priests or celebrants and the audience is drawn to participate with the actors in a kind of Eucharist. So he's making a, a drawing a comparison here between religious services and theater, which we will um, uh, discuss later on in the semester. There is a lot of um, similarities and a lot of connections between religion and theater. But in the first part of this um, quote, he's talking about the fact that you, when you go to see a play, it is a live experience. And because it's a live experience, you have a performer-audience relationship and you can interact with and change the performance. Whereas if you watch a movie, obviously it's all pre-recorded and there's not much you can do to change the outcome of the uh, performance of the production. Another way film and theater are different uh, from each other is that watching theater is always a group experience. You're part of a live audience, you're watching live actors, you're creating this performer on its relationship and not only can you affect the performance but the audience can affect each other and their perception of the performance. Now when you're watching television or you're watching a movie those can be group experiences amongst the audience members but never between the performer and the audience because there's not a performer audience relationship. The theater by its very nature is always a group experience. If you go to see a play and it's only you and the actor on stage it's still a group experience because of the performer audience relationship and your action and interaction with each other. Um, this is a quote from your book on page 30. Uh, when a collection of individuals respond more or less in unison to what is occurring on stage, their relationship to one another is reaffirmed, so the audience as a whole. If there's a display of cruelty at which we shudder, or sorrow by which we are moved, or pomposity at which we laugh, it is reassuring to have others respond as we do. For a moment, we are part of a group sharing an experience, and our sorrow or joy, which we thought might be ours alone, is found to be part of a broad human response. And you probably remember from your reading of Why Theater Matters, um, this came up a lot, the fact that um, uh, people respond to theater, the fact that it's a group and you can interact with and act on each other, and the fact that um, the stories being told in theater are uniquely human stories, and so we automatically feel some connection to or empathy with the characters because they are like us in some fundamental way. So because um, 
theater is a group experience. Uh, this means that you will sometimes see um, the audience uh, changing the perception of other audience members based on their action and interaction meaning that you could have um, almost like a collective mind or mob mentality situation where um, if nobody's laughing, you don't want to be the one person that laughs and stands out. You want to be like everyone else. Um, and so maybe you don't laugh even if you think something is funny. Or if everyone are laughing or applauding at something, maybe you feel the need to applaud. So what other people are doing and what you're doing um, can affect others. So there's a relationship among the audience members. So for example, if you go to see a play um, and at the end everyone um, stands up, they have a standing ovation and this happens, it's supposed to happen rarely um, when you feel really moved you know, to get to your feet because the uh, performance was so good, but everyone else is standing and, and you're not. You thought it was good, but maybe you didn't think it was that good and so you have to um, sort of make that decision, well do I stand because everyone else is or do I remain seated because I don't feel the urge uh, to give them a standing ovation. So again, a time when um, this group mentality, um, this uh, fact that you're within a group of your your peers of other audience members uh, could affect your um, what you do and, and how you think about a performance. All right, so who is in the audience itself can greatly impact the performance. Um, audiences can be broken up into two camps into two types of audiences. There are general audiences and homogenous audiences, and this has to do with the makeup of the audience. So in a general audience, they are made up of an eclectic mix of people from different backgrounds. So a slice of life, a little bit of everybody um, in this group. And some examples of general audiences would be sporting events. If you go to watch a football game or a soccer um, game, then you'll notice people um, from all walks of life, all ages, races, um, both genders. Um, so people from a little bit of, of everything in society. So a nice mixture, a general audience. Um, some performances on page 30, your book gives the example um, of a play called Unto These Hills, which is a play about the Cherokee Indians presented each summer on a Cherokee reservation in western North Carolina. And so this might draw a variety of people, a general audience. Uh, and then classrooms, if you um, are in a face-to-face -face classroom, you might look around, especially if you're on the UHD campus, um, and you'll notice that we have a wide variety of ages, ethnicities, races, um, a pretty even mix of males to females, and so our classrooms are often general um, audience type of classrooms. Now there could be exceptions, maybe you take a, a gender studies class that focuses on um, women's issues and it's mostly females in the class. Um, in that case it might be more of a homogenous audience, meaning that the um, audience is made up of people who have something in common. Now that doesn't mean all it's all women in the class, it could be the majority are women and there could be a few men as well. So homogenous doesn't mean 100% one group or another, um, but there's something linking these people together, some demographic that they all or most of them fall into. So for example, if you go to a high school play, um, all of these people probably have some affiliation with the high school, either their parents um, or their fellow students. Um, so you have a very specific type of group. Um, a political rally, all of these people um, probably have similar uh, political affiliations uh, and maybe the same political or social beliefs. And in fact, this is something that was noticed in the um, this very last election cycle, if you watch the um, Democratic National Convention and then the Republican National Convention, there was a very marked difference in the um, demographics and um, uh, uh, who these people were. If you watch the Republican National Convention, it was mostly middle class, white, and male. If you watch the um, Democratic National Convention, um, it was a wider variety of races. There was a mixture of male and female uh, and people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And so the RNC, the Republican National Convention, was more of a homogenous audience, whereas the DNC, the Democratic National Convention, was more of a general audience, a mixture of people. Uh, and then finally, another example of homogenous audience might be a chick flick. If you go to um, one of those movies that's marketed towards women, like romantic comedies or Ryan Gosling movies, um, then that's probably a homogenous audience of mostly women. And there might be men that were drugged there uh, by their wives or girlfriends or friends, uh, but it's probably going to be mostly a female audience, so that would be a largely homogenous audience. 
So what kind of audience you personally are in at the moment, um, general or homogenous, and then your relationship to that or those groups can you affect your perception of the performance. Um, the book talks about the fact that if we are among people of a like mind, um, maybe we feel more comfortable and relaxed and that could change our perception of the event. Whereas if um, it's a, maybe it's a homogenous audience but you're in the minority, if you, if you are a male and you go to see a chick flick, maybe you feel a little awkward uh, because you don't fit in with the, um, the homogenous group. Uh, so your relationship to other people in the audience is going to affect your perception. Now a note on this, um, I often get asked when you uh, go to see your plays this semester, um, students often ask me if there's a dress code involved, and there's not. Um, you can wear whatever you'd like, they'll let you in, um, just like to a movie theater. Um, but you are likely to see some people, especially at if you go to see a play like at the Alley Theater, you are likely to see people dressed up, uh, people from very different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, and then again maybe just people going on dates and they decided to, to dress up that evening. So you're likely to see um, uh, a pretty homogenous audience of these groups um, and don't feel too badly if you're underdressed um, and it's fine if you want to dress up, you won't, you won't be too overdressed. You'll see a little bit of everybody um, and every fashion style uh, at these events. So uh, there is no dress code uh, to these performances. You are likely to see something a little dressier, maybe at the alley or if you go to um, the downtown Wortham Theater, whereas if you go to see the play here on campus in the OK Theater, you'll see people in jeans and t-shirts um, coming from class and people that will look um, just like your everyday wear. All right, so audiences can be influenced by each other. Um, they can uh, act differently based upon their relationships to other people in the audience, as we've discussed, if you're friends or like-minded people versus if you're different um, or you feel alienated by other people in the group. So that can affect your but how good of a time you're having and what you feel about the play, how you connect to the play. Um, audiences can also be influenced and act differently based on their relationship to the play itself. If they know actual actors in it, or if the subject matter is somehow familiar to them, they might react and respond to it differently than if, again, it was more alien and different than what they're used to. Um, the example I usually give is of an experience I had probably about five or six years ago now um, when I went to see a play called Intimate Apparel in Atlanta at their um, Alliance Theater, which is their regional theater, like the Alley is our regional theater. So um, I went to the Alliance to see Intimate Apparel. Let me give you a little background story on this. Um, Intimate Apparel is a play about a young woman. Um, it's set at the early 20th century, like the 19-teens or 1920 or so, if I remember right. Um, and she's a young African-American woman who's moved from the country to the city. And she's kind of trying to find her way in this new life. Um, she makes Intimate Apparel. She makes um, underwear for uh, upper class women, so very nice, fancy underwear. So she comes in contact with people of a lot of different classes, different backgrounds, different races, and in fact, um, becomes friends with um, uh, a young uh, Hasidic man who makes, uh, who's a tailor, who makes clothing, and they develop sort of an unlikely friendship. Um, so it's about how she's coping with this new life in this new, um, new century, basically, the 20th century. Um, the play itself, very good, really good um, reception. Uh, it's, it's since um, played uh, in several cities over the U.S. In fact, in Houston, the um, Ensemble Theater produced it a couple of years ago, and it was uh, very well received there as well. But when I went and saw it at the Alliance in Atlanta, I saw it twice. I saw it on a Friday evening, and then I went back and saw it again on a Sunday matinee, same weekend, so just a couple of days um, difference from each other. and the makeup of the audience definitely affected the performance and affected other audience members. So for example, um, when I went to see it on Friday, it was a largely homogenous audience, I'm sorry, largely general audience. It was a, a mixture of people, so a little bit of everybody. It's Friday night, so a lot of um, young people on dates, um, older couples, people from all sorts of socioeconomic backgrounds um, and different races. And because the main character is an African American and it deals a lot with that transition from the um, rural to the urban um, African-American experience that I think it drew in a, a even greater homogenous audience of people um, from all sorts of backgrounds because it was not your traditional Western storyline. Um, so 
Uh, all that being said, it was a very general audience on Friday. It was well received. It was a good production. People liked it and clapped at the end. I went back two days later uh, on Sunday matinee, and a matinee is a daytime performance. It's usually about one or two in the afternoon, and a matinee draws what we call a blue hair audience. Blue hair um, being a um, uh, a nickname for older audience members uh, because maybe you know your hair goes white and you rinse it and it comes out a little bit blue. So blue hair audiences are older audience members. Um, and often these people will come, um, these older uh, audience members will come in groups, like maybe from a nursing home or a church group. And so they often know each other. They have a relationship to each other already. Uh, and in this particular case, it must have been a church group or a nursing home group um, that uh, that was, uh, they all knew each other. They were primarily African American. They're primarily women. So as a, a group of older African American women um, seeing a play from a time period that they didn't really live in, but their mothers and grandmothers did. So they had some connection to the time period. Um, and with a heroine who um, had maybe had similar experiences to themselves, had a, a similar background, and certainly the same ethnicity as they were. And so they felt a connection to the play, they felt a connection to each other, and that definitely changed how they reacted to the play. They were very vocal and verbal in a positive way. Um, they were very animated. And because of that and the performer audience relationship, the actors, I think, had a little bit more energy that night. And they, or it was during the day. It wasn't even that night. Um, it was during the day in the afternoon. So they felt a little bit more energy. And I think they gave a little bit of a better performance because of that, because of that give and take, that performer on its relationship between the two. Uh, and so this audience, very clearly homogenous, or a large majority of it um, was homogenous, knew each other, and had a connection to what was going on on stage, the storyline, uh, and to the um, experiences of the main character and so it definitely affected how they received and reacted to the play. Now finally audiences can also be influenced by outside events, uh, events outside of the play. So for example um, after 9-11 uh, in New York you saw a lot less musicals, less comedies, more tragedies, more serious plays uh, and part of that might have been because people were a little um, uh, overwhelmed by the tragedy that we're seeing on the news every single day and so they wanted to go see plays that were um, uh, maybe took them out of their existence made them forget their problems made them laugh feel happy uh, so plays about love romantic comedies um, these became very popular in the uh, months immediately after September 11th now eventually um, it settled back down and you did see some tragedies um, Macbeth a few years later um, did very well on Broadway so you did see um, the return of a variety of types or genres g-e-n-r-e-s genres of plays um, but uh, it took a little bit of time to get there. So again, what had immediately happened in a larger scale was affecting what audiences wanted to see, what they would pay to see, uh, and so it affected also what producers decided to put on stage because um, they're going to choose plays that could potentially make money so they can pay back their investors. So they were choosing plays um, that would satisfy this need for happier, lighter fare. Um, now that being said, these outside events don't have to be large catastrophic events like um, September 11th. They could be smaller events in your um, daily life that might affect your perception of the play. So for example, if you go to see a play and you um, uh, have a flat tire on the way there, which we all know is, is annoying and terrible. So you have a flat tire, you have to change it, you're running late, maybe you're a little sweaty and kind of dirty now, so it makes you more self-conscious, um, you're a little more irritable, and maybe you find it less that you are less able to get into the play and to enjoy it and to connect to it because of this outside experience that happened to you. Vice versa, it could be a, a good thing or a positive thing. Maybe there are outside experiences that you've had that help you relate to the play itself um, and so you really feel connected and you really enjoy it because of that. So audiences can be influenced by each other, the relationship to each other. They can also be influenced by the relationship to the play or people on stage and then also their relationship to outside events, things going on outside of the play. So all of these factors can change how you perceive and how you react to a play. So audience is a very fickle, finicky group. 
Now, there are two types of audience involvement in a play. You have um, audiences that are participatory, and you have audiences that are merely observed. So participatory theater versus observed theater. And in participatory theater, the audience is involved either vocally or physically with the production. So you're asked to come up on stage as a volunteer, or you're um, asked for your input, or to clap at a certain time. So these would all be um, um, uh, audience participation, participatory theater. Uh, and we have a clip here, and this is on Blackboard Learn, um, from a play called the 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. Uh, and in this clip, you'll notice that there are people on stage that aren't dressed like the other characters, and that's because these are audience members that are portraying characters. What happens when you go to see um, the 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, and it was on Broadway, won several Tonys, it's been produced um, uh, across the country ever since then, so it's a pretty popular play. You're likely to run into it if you go to see theater, if you go to see plays regularly. Um, so what happens is when you go to see this play, they usually have people out front uh, before the show starts asking questions or handing out questionnaires. And these questionnaires will um, ask you about your level of education, have you ever won a spelling bee before, um, what are your hobbies, and they're trying to find people that they think would be appropriate to take these three spots um, as audience participants. And these three people are brought on stage and they act as spellers. This play is about a spelling bee. It's um, adult actors portraying children, though, so it, it's pretty non-realistic from that standpoint. Um, but you, the audience member, if you were selected, would ask to become up to come up on stage, sit in the stands with the other spellers, the actors playing spellers, and spell words. And they ask about your level of education, if you're if you're a really good speller, because they want to pick people that um, are good enough that they can spell some of the easier words but they can throw a harder word at them and get them out at the appropriate time so they're no longer involved and they go back to their seats um, in the audience. And so what you'll see in this clip um, are uh, audience members who are unprepared, they don't know the lines, they don't know the lyrics of the song, they don't know the dance moves, but you'll see the actors sort of cleverly manipulating them uh, and moving them around the stage to where they need to be in. At one point, um, they move them into a circle and everybody steps away so the three audience members are all by themselves and they sort of point and laugh. It's, you know, meant to be kind of embarrassing and make the audience laugh and, and feel sympathy for these audience participants. So this is an extreme form of participatory theater. Is an audience member. Your last your word is elephant. <laughs>
So in that clip, um, we saw extreme audience participation in that the audience members are brought up on stage. So it's not always quite that extreme. Um, it could be just vocally participating or like in a magician's act where you come up for a moment and then you go sit back down. So um, any of those in that range of participation would be participatory theater. And there is a um, section in your book um, on page 33 called Global Cross Currents, um, August Boal, The Theater of the Oppressed. And um, in Boal's uh, theater, he specifically wanted to um, uh, make sure that the audience uh, was participating and actually involved on stage. So, um, so for example, one was the invisible theater in which actors seemingly spontaneously presented a prepared scene in a public space such as a town square or a restaurant. Another was this forum theater in which a play about a social problem became the basis of a discussion with audience members about solutions to the problem. So by choosing locations that were sort of outside of the norm where people weren't even sure if they were being involved in a um, production or a performance or not, um, he was thereby involving the audience and making sure they felt connected to the material and then hopefully changing changing their minds or informing them about an issue. So this is a way to, um, uh, to uh, push in a, a political agenda um, or a set of ideas as well. So in observed theater, the audience does not participate except very minimally through the performer-audience relationship. So there's some feedback there because of the performer-audience relationship, but it doesn't get much beyond that. Uh, and during or because of uh, the observed theater um, aesthetic, um, you are maintaining what's referred to as the fourth wall. So in this case, you're watching people on stage, you're not interacting, they're not acknowledging you, they're pretending like there's a fourth wall in between the audience and the, uh, and the actors themselves. Now the actors are aware of you, but they're pretending like you don't exist. So it's kind of like um, you're peeking into a dollhouse and seeing people go about their daily lives and, and they can't see you, you don't exist for them. This relates also to this idea of, uh, of aesthetic distance. Um, and aesthetic distance is the idea that uh, you should, or you, you need to um, uh, maintain a certain distance from what you're looking at, and this is on page 31, in order to see it wholly and objectively. And so there's kind of two um, forms of aesthetic distance. There's physical aesthetic distance, but then there's also emotional aesthetic distance where, um, uh, so in the case of physical aesthetic distance, perhaps you're in an art gallery, um, you're walking along looking at all the paintings, and then you come to a painting that's really quite large, and so you physically step back and gain some aesthetic distance. So you can see the entire thing and you can appreciate it as a whole. So that's physical aesthetic distance. And in the theater, that would um, be related to where you're seated in the theater. If you're really close, you have less aesthetic distance than if you're in the middle or further back where you can see the entire picture. Now when you sit further back though, you lose some detail. So there is, um, uh, there is a balancing act there, finding the, just the right seat. Now that's physical aesthetic distance. Emotional aesthetic distance in regard to the theater usually has more to do with the director's relationship to what's going on on stage. So we'll talk about the director more um, in an upcoming unit, but the director is uh, uh, putting the entire show together. They're in charge of everything. They go through months of rehearsal, research, um, preparing the, the, the production to be on stage in front of an audience. But <clears throat> at the same time, they have to try to maintain um, or find some emotional aesthetic distance so they can try to determine what the audience is going to see when they come watch the play and so they can see it through the audience's eyes. And part of that is that the um, director has to work with the actors and give the actor direction and notes about what they're doing and what it's going to communicate to a potential audience member. So they have to maintain or find an emotional aesthetic distance so they can act as the audience's eye and communicate that to the actor. Um, finally, symbolism. Your book talks a little bit about symbols, and symbolism is very important, um, especially important in the Glass Menagerie, which we'll be reading and discussing this semester. Um, symbolism is when you use something to stand in for something else, to communicate information or um, to uh, convey something to the audience. And symbols communicate ideas or emotions on stage that are often more complex and profound than the symbol itself. 
So the example I've given you here is the American flag. Highly symbolic. In reality, it's just a piece of fabric. It's made up of three colors and just a few geometric shapes. Very, very simple in substance. But what it symbolizes is a lot. Um, and you could think about very abstractly, you know, it, abstra it um, symbolizes freedom and justice and democracy. And there's all these sort of buzzwords that come to mind when you see the flag. Um, it has very literal symbolism in that the 50 stars stand for each of the states. The blue field stands for justice and dignity, red, hardiness and valor, white, purity and innocence. So the colors have very specific and the shapes have very specific meanings as well. Likewise, say we took this symbol, which is highly charged with a lot of meaning, um, and we put it on stage, and maybe the entire set is in shades of red, white, and blue, or there's flags in, in lots of places, or the costumes are in red, white, and blue. So that, that would suggest something to you, the audience member. Um, even before the play started, you might think this play is about patriotism, or war, or politics, or something related to the flag. And so you can start making assumptions and information would be conveyed to you based on using these symbolic colors and um, uh, symbolic symbols um, of, uh, of the American uh, people. All right, so realism in theater. And this is more like a sliding scale rather than realism versus non-realism. You have realism on one extreme end, you have non-realism on the other end. Um, what this is referring to is how realistic a play is. So for example, realism, um, if a play is realistic, if it fits into the realism um, format, it conforms to observable reality. So it seems like something that could actually happen. The story could actually happen. The setting looks like a real place. The characters seem like people that could actually exist in reality. So that's realism. Non-realism realism does not conform to observable reality, or it deviates in certain places. For example, the story couldn't actually happen. There's elements that don't seem realistic or fantastical. Um, the setting uh, does not look like a real place um, that actually exists. Um, it's strange or, or different in some way. Um, the characters seem like people are things that don't actually exist. So um, we talked about the Lion King earlier and the fact that um, we're using personification on these animals, giving them human traits, human characteristics. So that would automatically mean it's non-realism. Musical theater, musical plays, non-realism because people don't just sing and dance uh, in the middle of their day. Or if they do, not everyone else knows the words and the steps. So musical theater would be non-realism. Um, on page 40, there's a really nice chart, um, a list of elements of realism and non-realism in regards to story, character, action, language, scenery, lighting, costumes, and makeup. And they give you some examples of realistic characters and non-realistic characters, or realistic makeup and non-realistic makeup. And realism versus non-realism, as I said, it's a sliding scale and there's a gray area in the middle. And many plays fit somewhere in the middle. They have elements of realism. They seem like um, they could actually happen or the characters seem really realistic, but then they deviate from reality in some ways, like a musical or a dream sequence or a narrator speaking directly to the audience. Um, so you can have a play that fits somewhere in the middle, like The Glass Menagerie. It has elements of both realism and non-realism. So as you're reading it, sort of pay attention to that. There's projections in the background of images and words. Um, we have Tom acting as the narrator, speaking directly to the audience, and then becoming a character, and then coming out and becoming the narrator again at the end. So there's a lot of elements that are non-realistic, although the story seems like it could actually happen. The characters seem like they could really exist. So it's somewhere in the middle of realism. It has both elements of realism and non-realism. This is an image on your book on page 38, um, two very different productions. Um, and just glancing at these images without even really knowing anything about them, you can probably guess which one is realism and which one is non-realism. So you probably guess that the one on top is realistic. Um, it's a very realistic setting, looks like a kitchen that could actually exist. Um, all of the props look like they could really exist. And props is a word that is short for property, meaning all of the objects on stage, like the chairs and the tables and the food preparation stuff, the, the curtains. All of these are props, and all of these look 
real, like they could really exist in a real kitchen. And then the characters look realistic. Two older ladies um, wearing house dresses, uh, very um, characteristic of an actual little old lady in a kitchen. So this looks like a real scene, looks like it could really happen. And the play at the top um, is called Having Our Say, The Delaney Sisters' First Hundred Years. So I haven't seen it. You probably haven't seen it either or even heard of it, um, but just by glancing at it, we can tell, okay, this play is probably pretty realistic, about realistic people and realistic subject matter. The one at the bottom, very non-realistic setting, strange shapes and colors that suggest things, just like the suggestion of a chair and table back there, um, but it's not realistic by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the characters are in very odd poses, so they're not moving in a realistic way, whereas the women up top look relaxed, they're in poses that uh, someone might actually um, adopt in a kitchen. Um, there's strange lighting effects here. Notice uh, there's the, the big green shape at the top that the man in purple is in. So the lighting's very suggestive and perhaps it's symbolic as well. Notice we have um, this funny little duck guy who's being highlighted in the bottom corner. So um, this is a Robert Wilson play, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this is Black Rider, the casting of the magic bullets. So it's very avant-garde, very non-realistic. So even without knowing the plays, just glancing at them, you can tell right away which one's realism, which one's non-realism. And these are two extreme forms of realism and non-realism. And some plays fall in the middle and have elements of both. So as I mentioned, your book um, talks about realism and non-realism um, and gives you some excellent examples on page 40 of what is realistic and what's non-realistic in theater. And you're likely to run into elements of both um, uh, throughout the semester, definitely in the Glass Menagerie, um, but also in the plays that you view this semester.